Need your daily fix on mixed martial arts? We're going to kind of recap Bellator 155. From UFC 198. Who's who? Kind of a controversial decision. And who's not? I couldn't figure out why, and then it hit me. Well, don't you fret, because Golden State Media Concepts got, got you, you covered. covered. Get your daily dose of MMA podcasts. Everything from the UFC, Bellator Fighting Championships, Extreme Cage Fighting, and Victor Fighting Championships, and, and, and so, so much, much more. more. Join us as we talk about some of the biggest names in mixed martial arts. We've got you covered here on Golden State Media Concepts MMA Podcast. Thank you for tuning into the GSMC MMA Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Arnold DeLeon, and hopefully your day is going well. Wherever you are, whoever you are, hopefully you're all persevering through yet another tough year, that is, of 2021. But as we're moving forward towards hopefully a brighter future, things are going well in the world of MMA as they move forward. We have PFL, their season will be starting about in the month of April. Meanwhile, we got Bellator, they got plans coming up, their, their rankings have all been shifted. The UFC have shifted their rankings. One championship, they have events coming up, a whole plethora of events, especially in the month of February. And also the UFC, they got shows coming up. They have an upcoming major UFC event with Izzo Desanya versus Jan Blachowicz. Champion versus champion. Me and my friends were incredibly hyped up for the matchup. But as we are all prepping up for the upcoming UFC show, we also have a plethora of MMA bouts to go looking to, including Unbreakable 3. Unbreakable 3. One of the events coming in from one championships, which you can watch, by the way, at Bleach Report Live on YouTube. All the events are readily available for you the day right after the event on Bleach Report Live. You get the entire full show. This show here for Unbreakable 3, one championships, was 2 hours, 21 minutes, and 40 seconds long. And so, yeah, you know what? Understandably, there's a lot of product to keep up with. There's a whole lot of them. Uh, one of the... Uh, coincidentally, one of the best parts... Of the fact that sports is moving kind of slow, but we're kind of moving forward, is the fact that because there's not that many shows out there, there are shows for like one championship and there's shows for UFC. But two years ago, we had one championship shows on top of Bellator shows, on top of PFL shows, on top of, Vi- of Invicta shows, on top of UFC shows. It's a whole lot of fights to go watch, a whole lot of events to watch. And I even talked about this where I was saying that it was difficult to get into one championship because there were so many events, so many MMA organizations. But you know what? Things kind of being slow right now, I think it's the perfect time to go get into other MMA organizations. And so I've been trying to get into one championship since the beginning of the year. And I am really amped for this. I feel like that the women's divisions in one championships completely blows away like all the other competition for PFL, for Invicta, and for Bellator. And I still remember reading reports of seeing like Zhang Jingnan versus Zhang Weili being a pistol dream match, a chat three Tong mentioned in a recent interview. And when I read that, I was like, oh my god, it's like a dream, like a dream fight, heck yeah. But a part of me was like, okay, there's no way this can really happen. I think there's going to be that much traction for seeing one versus UFC. But you know what? Uh, as time goes on and as I continue to watch the show, I'm like, oh my goodness, there needs to be more of this. Like, I want to see a lot of one championship fighters move over to the West and compete in fights. At the time of this recording, it turns out that, I, don't know, I think it was in Singapore, where the UFC, they were trying to go get a the, the main event for Zhang Weili versus Rosen Aminus, which was counted as official. It's official. These are going to square off at UFC, at a future UFC pay-per-view event coming up on April. Yeah, it'll be coming up on April. And so, Dana White has said that he's trying to go push for for this event happening in Asia. So we're in Asia. Abu Dhabi is in Asia, technically, but he wanted East Asia. So they've been trying to book for East Asia show. It turns out that entire thing, it got scrapped. So we might see Zhang Weili versus Rosen Amunis happen in the uh, in the UFC Apex Facility Building in Las Vegas, which is really upsetting to me because, note though, when you watch one championships, there is an audience there. There's an audience. Now, before every show, it says like, closed audience, but you can hear the people. There are people chanting, there are people booing in these one championship shows. It just that uh, there's no one thing that one championships hasn't done, 
with their shows, especially in like in the, in, in the cage, they don't like ever pan over to a crowd shot. They never do. Now, for a couple of UFC shows, there are indeed crowd members there. It exists. But for the UFC Apex facility building, there is no crowd. There isn't. So, I would like to see, you know, I would love to see Zhang Wei versus Rosalind Muniz in a packed stadium or a, in a stadium with a crowd. But, sadly, we're not going to see that. So, in one championships, in Singapore, they do have a crowd. And it still does, like, make me excited and make me happy for the future of MMA year 2021. Because, you know what, you love seeing this. Like, them coming out through the entrances and them, like, shaking hands and, like, high-fiving people. You know what? As long as they're following the health protocols, I don't really see the problem with it, though. If they're following health protocols and doing what they're doing is legal in the country or in the state that they're, uh, that they're doing it in, then you know what? I think it's all fine. Two thumbs up there. But UFC Unbreakable 3, this is the... S- so, one thing I'll say about these one championship shows, I'm just going to say since for now, is that... They name all these shows. I think the next one championship event is called Fists of Fury. Yeah, so it's one championship Fists of Fury, and in the show they have like they have a multitude of fights. It's coming up uh, next Friday, and the show after this is Fists of Fury two, and Fists of Fury three, and so I'm guessing every month they have a series of shows, but like there's no actual theme. For these shows. Like Fist of Fury 1, Fist of Fury 2, Fist of Fury 3. There's like nothing like overlapping each other in terms of narratives or stories. I watched every unbreakable event for one championship. And at some moments we have, oh yeah, the main event is between these two giant behemoths. Like grappling and fighting with one another. Next thing you know, we got like a Muay Thai competition being the main event. And then we have like a woman's bout. Including one fighter who is formerly a Muay Thai and kickboxing fighter in Stamp Vertex. So, the there are, like, no narratives in any of these shows. It's just, like, Unbreakable 3 is not a sequel to Unbreakable 2, kind of. It's it's not the same show. You can watch Unbreakable 3 without watching Unbreakable 2. And the same thing applies for Unbreakable 2 and Unbreakable 1. There's no actual, like, theme around them. I don't know. That kind of upsets me. I like to see, like, certain themes happening. Like... Oh, like, like, there's one month it's that's dedicated to the heavyweights, or one month dedicated to the lightweights, or one month de- dedicated to featherweights. That's something I would love to see, and I think a lot of MMA fans would definitely appreciate that. But, let's discuss one championship's Unbreakable 3. Introducing us to the show is Michael Chabello and Chatri Sititong. They introduce us to the show. Stamp Fair Ticks vs. Aloy Now Rosahinia is the main event. The narrative of this fight is we got youth versus experience. We got the veteran fighter in Rosahinia versus the fighter in Stan Feratex, who by the end of the show is booked as if she is a mega superstar. Like her and Anjali, they're both 24 years old respectively. Like they're both 24 years old respectively, and yet they are the champions for the biggest, of like in a global scale, the biggest MMA organization in the world in one championships. It's insane. Absolute insanity here. So Sam Ferretex, she's kind of being heralded as this girl is a three-sport athlete. And telling right now, as somebody who hung out with a lot of three-sport athletes back at school, back at university, and back at school, you know, it's ridiculous. It is insane how some of these people can do, can be so committed to three different types of martial arts. And so for Sam Ferretex, it was kickboxing, Muay Thai, and she's trying to go dabble in an MMA. Now, her goal has been for the past couple years to be the first and only person in one championship to hold a trophy or to hold a championship in a singular division in three different martial arts. So, for those of you unaware, in one championships, they have the kickboxing title, the Muay Thai title, and the MMA title for each division. We have the same place for like middleweights and welterweights and like lightweights and flyweights. There is a lightweight kickboxing champion, there is a lightweight Muay Thai champion, and a lightweight MMA champion. And there are fighters across, like, one championship, specifically in MMA, who are coming in from, like, two different sports. There was a fighter, I think, a couple... I think it was a couple months back, where there was a fighter who made a name for himself in MMA. Like, the industry started as a kickboxer, then went to MMA, then after, like, a 10-year hiatus, then came back into primarily competing at kickboxing. And that's how it is for one championships here. So for Stan Fairtex, at 24 years old... She was the Muay Thai champion. She was, I think she was the Atomweight. She was the Atomweight Muay Thai champion. The Atomweight kickboxing champion. And then she was trying to be also the Atomweight MMA champion. Which is where Angelique's at. Where she's the current champion. 
But on her way there, she and she sadly ended up losing both belts, and so now she's focusing all her time in MMA. And spoiler warning right now, things did not go well for Stan Fairtex, and it looks like Stan Fairtex, for as much as she has an incredibly high ceiling in terms of potential. Incredibly high ceiling for potential. It's just a matter of whether she can go put it together consistently. And it feels like for Sam Fairtex, we're seeing somebody who's got all the tools, but has a tendency of like turning off her brain in integral moments in fight in fights. And in this scenario here, where, for, where she fights against Ole so, uh, Rosalina, she's uh, an experienced fighter, a German fighter, a proper veteran who's a great grappler fighting against a kickboxer slash Muay Thai specialist in Sam Fairtex. So, this is a stylistic matchup. Youth versus age. He's saying, Rosalina isn't even that old. She's not. She's only a couple years older than Fairtex, but Rosalina has got a lot more experience in grappling and MMA over Fairtex. Note though, Chatri Sititong, as he is talking about his fight, he continues doing it. He did that thing that I chewed him out for last time, where... His hand is shaking, holding the microphone, and as he is looking from the camera here, he is, not only does he come across as awkward, but also this dude does the same thing as usual, where he is talking away from the microphone. Yeah, he's still doing that. He's like, I'm excited for this bout here, and quite frankly, I always believe Sam Fairtex is going to fight against Rosalina, and then this night is full of action, and I'm excited for it. I don't know, can someone like help this guy out? <laughs> Uh, but also, we have a plethora of other matchups uh, to come. So, we also have the first fight of the night. We got TL Tang versus Paul Lumihi. Uh, Lumihi. And for this entire night here, there are presentation issues that I am surprised that the One Championships has still never really, like, adjusted. Or I don't think they recognize it as, like, weird presentation. So, interesting to us to the show, we have Michael Chavello and Chakri Sititong. And then, like, you never see Chakri Sititong again. Until at some point in the middle of the show here, like, like he just like, he just randomly pops in. Like, I don't know, like, like, Chattery, like, he's there sometimes, and he's not there. It's like, Chattery Setidong is like the opposite of Dana White, where he's like overly involved, but he's also trying to be overly involved in presentation, because now you're like, now he's like kind of the expert guy who's like asking questions at times, and he's like, he's introducing it to the show. And then we have Mitch Chilson, the dragon. Who Michael Chavello loves saying all the time. He's like, it's me, Michael Chavello, and the dragon over here. Like, he doesn't, he doesn't say Michael Shilson. He says, like, the dragon. So, introducing, to, introducing us to the show, we have Michael Chavello and Chapter Sitetong. Sitetong being awkward. Chavello pretty much yelling in front of the camera. Then we get to the middle of fights, or we get to the, the introduction of a fight. And then it turns out that we have Mitch Chilson, who's like, Omnipotent spirit appears in the show here. Like he's never introduced. He never is. And it's like, I'm oh, Michael Chavello. Here's Chucky Sitadong. And like 15 minutes later, it's like, I'm oh, Michael Chavello. Here's Miss Chilson talking. By the way, you don't even see Miss Chilson. You don't. You see the guy in like post fight interviews. But then we also have Rich Ace Franklin. Yeah, that Rich Franklin, former UFC champion. He's also there, but he's not a commentator. But he's there when he needs... It's a, I never understood a, like Rich Franklin shtick here. I don't get it. Because apparently, Rich Franklin is there. Like, he's there next to Mitch Chilson and Michael Chavello. But... And then Michael Chavello and Mitch Chilson, they talk about Rich Franklin. And then they ask Rich Franklin for, a, for his opinion. And then Rich Franklin doesn't talk. And then sometimes you can just hear his voice, but they throw up the graphic there being like, your main announced team here, Mitch Chilson and Michael Chavello. And then they don't mention like Rich Franklin being there, but then like you'll hear Michael Chavello asking, hey, Rich Franklin, what's your opinion in this fight? And then you hear Rich Franklin's voice just pop in when he's not introduced. And then he sometimes appears in the middle or end of the show to give his like post fight summary even though Mitch Chilson is already doing that, and he does that after Chatri Sitiatong does it also. The presentation and the commentary team is just so out of nowhere. It isn't. Because there are moments in the show here 
where Rich Franklin, he's not going to say anything for the first round. And then by the tail end of the second round, you hear his voice. And then he's like, here's my opinion on the fight here. And then Rich Franklin does end up playing the role as like the play-by-play guy. Or he sometimes played the role as a color commentator. So he's like overlapping Chilson and Chevello. I just never understood Rich Franklin's like... I Look, okay, maybe he's supposed to be the color commentator since he's not the play-by-play guy. Chilson is supposed to be like the former fighter giving his experience and giving his viewpoint on fights. Okay, that makes sense. But Miss Chilson by himself, like he's not the most like credible dude in terms of former fighter giving his opinion. Because Miss Chilson doesn't really have that strong of a resume compared to other fighters, especially Rich Franklin, in terms of giving their viewpoint and opinions on fights. This is something that I am struggling to adjust to, but you know what? I'm going to get through it. So you're listening to the GSMC MMA Podcast, coming back after a short break here. See you soon. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. And we are back as I am discussing one championship's unbreakable three. So let's go on to the first fight of the night, which is TL Tang versus Paul Lumihi. It is a bantamweight MMA bout. So Tang barrels his way towards Lumihi and essentially becomes a flashy striker versus a wrestler bout. So he goes towards Lumihi and clinches with him onto the cage, but Lumihi switches positions as the two are trading off knees. The two are trading off leg kicks and body kicks. Stang tries for a takedown, but Lumihi attempts for a back elbow. It's very strange because even Chilson was laughing about it. And what Lumihi has been doing in this fight here, it's like, okay, Lumi is the cool guy who does all the like, like flying roundhouse kicks, spinning back elbows, flying forearms, super round punches. Like, he goes for like a bunch of like high kicks. They don't do anything but hit the air. And TL Tang here, this guy does not respect his striking game at all. He just doesn't here. And in all the striking exchanges, no matter how many times Michael Chevello and Miss Chilson are like, oh man, the striking is really good. Oh, me. Wow. Not really. Not really. The two are training off leg kicks and body kicks. Uh, Dang tries to go for a takedown, but Lumi attempts to go for a back elbow. And Lumi does actually land the back elbow. He does. But Dang just eats it up, shoots in for a double leg takedown. Now, Tom is able to get a takedown, and he does go for a little ground pound action here, but Lumihi gets up after just a couple seconds onto the ground. So, Lumihi does show here that, yes, he is someone easy to take down, and you don't have to respect his range, because Tang can just eat it all. And also, Tang, he is, he is winning in all the exchanges in the stand-up. So, although Lumihi, he can be taken down easily and is losing in the stand-up, he prefers that way, as Tang does struggle keeping him to the ground. They both get back up. Lumi attempts a spinning hook kick. Yeah, he he attempts a spinning hook kick. Then Tang just slows, like slowly, just walks his way down towards Lumi. He no respect for the guy striking at all. Like he's just dodging and he's avoiding all these high kicks. Lumi is trying to go for a poking game. He's trying to poke him with a bunch of body kicks and high kicks. Tang is trying to go for several flash kicks. Uh, Tang is pressuring him down. Uh, Tang tries to go for a takedown, but accidentally hits him in the groin with a knee strike. Completely accidental. It slows down the pace of the fight. So the fight then takes a short break, but the two then again meet each other in the center of the cage. Tang is mostly trying to land overhand rice and then towards a left hand jab combination. Tang tries to go for a takedown and is able to get it in the final 10 seconds of the first round bout. The bell sounds off. Not the much ground pound action. Tang landed about maybe two, maybe three strikes. 
in the guard position. But other than that, though, not really that much in terms of him dominating his opponent. It was a very close back and forth battle, but for the most part, Dial Tong ended up winning the first round. Second round starts. So Tong pressures Lomihi with a series of strikes, then shoots in for a takedown. So you know what? Nope, no more of this feeling out period. He's gonna go in there, blitz in for a takedown. Dang lifts him up in the air, hits him with a spine buster, slams him onto the ground. Dial Tong at guard is pressing Lumihi onto the cage and doing some ground pound action. Lumihi is trying to stand up, but Lumihi brings down brings him down yet again onto the ground and continues to do a little bit more ground pound action. So with the house positioned, usually if you talk to someone like Daniel Cormier, they'll see something along the lines of, okay, it's actually a good thing to be pressed onto the cage. Because then you can go use the cage as a way to hoist yourself up when you're in bottom position. And I completely disagree with that. I completely do. Because with the way how T.L. Tang was pressuring his opponent and putting all his body weight down, we've seen this a lot of times in fights. We see it a lot with Kwan Usman when he was wrestling his Hori Masvidal. Where Hori Masvidal would try to use the cage as a way to leverage himself up, as what Dominic Cruz and Darren Cormier uh, are saying all the time whenever they see a, a striker versus a wrestling bout. But the wrestler knows this. And as they are trying to get up, they put all their weight down on them. So you're putting, you're making your opponent more tired by having let, by trying to let them go get back up. Like you actually kind of like it. Like here's the thing: if given the option to ground pound your opponents or put, or to put all your weight down on your opponent as they're trying to go get back up, you want to do the second one because your opponent is exerting all their energy. They're trying to go lift their own weight as well as yours. As they are pressing you downward. So it's incredibly difficult for the fighter. I say right now that it's a lot more difficult for a fighter. To get out of bottom position. Through being pressed up on the cage. As opposed to if they're in the middle. Because if they're in the middle. Who knows. There's actually like a lot more room for the person on the bottom. To go do a lot more work. They're more free in their movement. They're not handicapped with their body. With the back being towards the direction of the cage. It's a lot more pressure. A lot more weight being put on them. When they're on the cage. Compare that to being a lot more free flow when you're in the bottom. So, yes, I do agree with Cormier's assessment that you can use the cage as a way to leverage yourself up, but it puts yourself in a bad position and you can exert a whole lot of energy from doing so, and it makes it a lot more easier for their opponent to do some ground pound action on you as they're punching your face and you're in the back of your head is slamming onto the cage. That does not look bueno. And that's what happens here. Dang, ground pound action, putting down all the power, putting on all the weights onto the body of Lomihi, and so the referee ends up stopping the bout. As the fight ends via TKO in the second round, as Steel Tong is able to defeat Paul Lomihi with, through a series of wrestling and ground and pound action. So congratulations for Tia Tang. Also note though, he is working under the tutelage of Ong Lo Song. And there was a moment in this fight here which made me laugh, and it was Ong Lo Song. So, as Tia Tang was doing ground and pound action, Onto his opponent. Because they hit him over and over again with overhand rights. The camera then cuts to the back of Angla. And you can hear the commentary team. They're like, yep, there's Angla Saw here. One of the greatest of all time. The best ever. You know, he's the mentor of Tia Tang. Showing him some great wisdom. And you can see this Angla with his phone out. So we have this camera view. Of the camera is looking at the back of the head of Angla Song. While looking at his camera. So we're watching like, so it's a camera looking at another camera looking at the fight. But Ong Lang Song, he was, I don't know what this guy was pointing at. Because this dude, he was like not even looking or recording the actual like fight. It's weird because Ong Lang Song, all you got to do is you got to press the middle button, like the, the red button. Press the red button and then it will record. And he's recording the fight. But, <laughs> it's interesting. But he did not press it. Like, the camera is on, but he didn't turn it on, if, if it makes any sense. Because when you put the camera mode onto your phone, you gotta go to camera mode, they gotta press the red button, and then it's gonna show that you are recording the fight. You're recording what the camera's pointing at. What Ang La was doing, was he's got the camera on, and he's pointing at the fight, and he's giving advice to Tia Tang, but the camera is not turned on in the camera mode, and so... You're, and also, Ang Lang Sa, he's not even pointing the camera correctly. It's like he's like pointing at the far right side of the fight, so you're barely seeing the action on his camera. So, and me being like the broadcast journalist that I am, I'm just like, dude, oh my goodness. A, turn on your camera. And B, like, record the actual fights. If, if, 
I don't know. If he, even if he's trying to, like, pretend to record the fights, maybe, maybe. Like, there's no way I can imagine a guy who who does not know how to turn on the camera. But this guy, he's got his phone out, and it looks like he's recording the camera. He's, he, he's recording the fight, but he's not because he didn't press the button. And also, he's recording on the right shoulder of Tia Tang instead of the actual fight. And there's, like, a lot of, like, empty space available on the right side of Ang Song's camera. It looked very bizarre. And you can hear Michael Chevelle in the background being like, Look at that! You know, Ang Long Song recording the footage to study for the fight. And I'm like, dude, no, he's not. He's not. Like, the dude for obviously forgot to press the record button. Whatever. That was, like, my big takeaway from that because that's really weirded me out. And then we go to the second battle of the night, which is Raut Raju versus Ahmed Mujaba. So this is a lightweight MMA bout, and this bout was under a minute long. You know what I'm going to say? One punch knockouts. One punch, man. One punch knockout here. Both fighters, they're just poking slowly. And to be perfectly honest with you, the knockout looked really good, but oh my goodness, this fight was very sloppy. It was a minute of super sloppy fighting happening. And also, you can hear it in Michael Chabello and Mitch Chilson's voice here. Because usually, for one-punch knockouts, people are either stunned sounds, or they're like, Whoa, what a knockout here! And this is a re- reoccurring thing that I found with Michael Chabello here. It's in the sense that Michael Chabello, he just doesn't get excited from knockouts. Like, he is more excited off them coming into, like... I don't, I don't know what's with, with the Michael, Michael Chabello here. Because... Raju gets knocked out. Mujitaba here, he ducks a overhand right, ducks down, goes with his own right hand, knocks out his opponent with one punch. You know, even in slow motion, you can see the guy's like, like his mouth guard is flying up in the air. And it takes like four, maybe five seconds for Michael Chevelle to register the knockouts. And instead of being like, whoa, what a knockout, that's insane! Instead, Michael Chevelle is like, Yep, look at that knockout there. Definitely happened. <laughs> like I've Michael Chevelle, he is excited for the parts when nothing is happening, but he's like bored as all heck in moments and fights that should be exciting. It is so bizarre. Like this is an insane knockout, and it will go down as one of the best knockouts in all of MMA in the year 2021. But Mitch Chilson and Michael Chevelle, man, their reaction, wow. Strong knockout there. You know, decent performance. <laughs> decent performance. That guy pretty much got one punch knockout, walk, like walk off KO. And was the fight sloppy as all heck and probably like turned on the volume of excitement? Yeah, it was. Because we had these two fighters here who are poking, but they're like poking very far away from each other. Like there's poking and then there's like, okay, dude, you guys are like nowhere near each other. None, neither of your guys' strikes are coming close. You guys are going for these body shots that have such wide openings that a simple counter strike will knock either of you two guys out. And that's what happened here. Uh, Raju was like overly aggressive, but at the same time somehow passive simultaneously. It's hard to explain it. Where the bell sounds off, these two fighters, they like meet halfway in the center of the cage and then Mujitaba here he's like sidestepping and like moving around as if he's like trying to like avoid stuff and then which honestly it didn't really play that much into the fight here because all Mujitaba had really had to do was just go for a simple overhand because Raju here at the start of the fight is going for these body shots but not but they're not your traditional boxing body shot they're like he tries to go for body shots with his left hand, but his right hand just goes limp, and he's a taller opponent, but he's doing, like, the body shots in close range when he... I, I, like, it is so hard to explain this, actually, but the fighting in the second fight, the second fight here was super sloppy. Michael Chevelle and Mitch Chelson, they went from, there's gonna be a great bout to, like, yep, one punch knockout there. That was definitely exciting. Good job there for Ahmed Muchaba. You know, first round knockout. That was under a minute. By the way, the way how I'm talking right now, I sound more excited than them. Because Mitch Chilson was like, that fight went under a minute, apparently. 
All right, then. Let's cut away to the next fight over here. And so they're talking about the rest of the card. And Michael Chevelle is more excited discussing, We got Stamp Fair Dex! Versus, like, like he's a lot more excited for that. Like, he is so amped for the entrances. But he just doesn't really say that much in, like, in the actual fights. And then I know I'm just, like, dogging down on, like, Michael Chevelle as a commentator here. But it is so distracting. Rich Franklin... Who, by the way, like, in this show here, they're having a conversation, a one-way conversation with Rich Franklin. Rich Franklin doesn't say anything in this entire fight. He's got nothing to say as, like, Chevelle's asking questions to Rich Franklin. And then the fight starts. And then, like, there's, like, no play-by-play. It's weird. But I know, it was hard to do commentary for this fight. Like, if I was the play-by-play guy, I'd be like, yep, look at those two guys. They're very far away from each other. A whole lot of movements. Nothing really happening here. Ugly body shots. One push knockout. Wow. Like that pretty much was the commentary for this bout here. You know what? Uh, Miss Chelson, he did his best as a commentator. He did his best talking about the fight because there are moments. This is a one minute fight, but it felt like a really long one. It's strange because there was so little activity happening this bout here that when something did happen it was like well really something actually happened wow because even when i was watching this i was like oh my goodness these are lightweights but yet they're moving incredibly slow if you told me these two were middleweights i'd be like yeah they're obvious middleweights here they are fighting these two fighters here who but you know what i will say this it was an impressive knockout okay Rat Ruju, I am not impressed, and that looked like a very ugly showing for you. And hopefully down the line, we can see both these fighters compete in a bigger division, because I don't see themselves competing on lightweights. They just didn't look good. You're listening to the GSMC MMA Podcast. Come back after a short break here as I further discuss one championship's unbreakable three. See you soon. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. And we are back. And so I am reviewing one championship's Unbreakable 3. And we go to the heavy division here, or whatever exists in the heavy division for one championships. It is an MMA bout between Manny Bargi and Kang Juan. So going to this bout here, Kang Juan, he definitely doesn't look like that threatening of a guy. To be perfectly honest, we got Manny Bargi, this like jack dude. Then we got Kang Juan, who's like fat looking. He doesn't look all that intimidating. And then they square off. Then Manny Bargi, with no fear, goes in, double leg takedown, takes Kenji one out. And so this bout was essentially a Russell versus Russell exchange here. We got two rushes going at it, and Bargi, t- he takes down Kenji one, does some ground pound action, they sprawl around. Manny Bargi, he's always on top. Like, he got in mount position twice in this battle. And it, it was very strange because. Mehdi Bargi, despite the fact he looked like he was the more in-shape fighter of the two, he just couldn't control his opponents. He couldn't. Mehdi Bargi did that thing that a lot of wrestlers have a tendency of doing, in a sense that they are so overcommitted to the ground and pound action. They're overcommitted to the ground pounding. They're over- they're overcommitting themselves into making sure that they're going to go and unload all these strikes onto their opponents. 
that instead they're not controlling their opponent at all with their body weights. It's not happening here. So Mehdi Bargi, he gets on top position twice on mount, and then consecutively in a row within the span of seconds, just mere seconds here, Kang Jiwon is able to get out of it and get himself on to top position. This happened twice, and it's all happened in the first round here. Bargi goes in, takes down, takes out Kang Jiwon, goes into mount, and then Kang Jiwon gets out of it. Bargi goes in, grapples him, another double leg takedown, gets on mount again, and then Kang Jiwon just turns around, and then he gets on top mount of Bargi. And then Bargi, he tries to go and like get out the exact same way Kang Jiwon was. But Bargi was so obviously out of it, dude. If you had a, there was a still, there was a frame of both of them when they were on top. So when Kang Juan, when he was on top of Bargi, Bargi, he was gassed out. He was breathing heavily. Kang Juan, he really didn't attempt all that much. He pretty much rope doped for the majority of this fight here. Where he, like, he got himself taken down. He's defending all the strikes. And then when Bargi just got like, oh man, I'm tired. I'm tired throwing these forearms, throwing these elbow smashes. Kang Juan just gets out. And then he puts him on top position. So, this really was a essence of Kang Jiwon, the out of shape looking guy who's got impressive cardio and is like mentally dialed in in terms of like handling all these shots and knowing when to reverse and knowing when to get better positioning. Versus Medi Bargi here, who's this jack guy who fought very recklessly. He kind of, okay, okay, so I don't mind fighters just shooting in, double leg takedown. But they also need to like control their opponents because Bargi here, he takes him down, doesn't control him, just does ground and pound, which made it easier for Kang Jiwon, who was a freestyle wrestler, to go in such positions. So Kang Jiwon ended up winning the fight via TKO because as Bargi was uh, turning around, Kang Jiwon get onto the back of Bargi, doing in some forearms from the back of the head. Referee stops the fight, and Kang Jiwon ends up winning the bout via TKO in the first round via ground and pound despite the fact that he was ground and pound for the majority of this fight. And then we get to the second bout here, which pretty much is the same thing, actually, with Ryota Sawada and Robin Catalan. It is a strawweight MMA bout here, where we got one fighter going in, getting the takedown, and then their opponent is able to go reverse out of the position, and he was able to get on back of the position and wins the fight via submission. So we had Ryota Sawada winning the fight via submission in just the first round via rear naked choke. It was a really great showcase for both fighters here. Um, I'm sorry that I'm not getting into depth into Sawada versus Robin Catalan here because the fight was very similar to the last one. We got one fighter, Bargi and Catalan, overcoming themselves in the takedown, in the grappling, in the striking, or they end up, that they ended up burning themselves out and getting incredibly tired early on. And then they get put in the position as a result of, as a result of their bad cardio into getting them either TKO'd or submitting. So congratulations for Kang Ji Won with his uh, with his grappling abilities and was able to go win his fight via TK on the first round. While Ryo Sawada is able to utilize his grappling abilities defensively and get a submission victory with a rear naked choke in the first round as well. So congratulations for both of those two fighters. And so let's move on to the co-main event of the night, which is a bantamweight MMA bout between number two ranked Shoko Sato versus Fabricio Andrade. So versus Fabricio Andrade here, he's only 23 years old, which is amazing. There is a nine year age difference between the two fighters. Andrade here, he is unranked while Sato is ranked number two. Winner of this bout might fight against John Lineker. Then the winner of that bout will then become the new number one contender for the Bantamweight title for one championships. So there's a lot on the line here. And to me, this probably was the most evenly matched fight of the entire night. It might even arguably be the best fight of the night because this bout involved two fighters who were very evenly matched and if these sort of fight multiple times over and over again like over 100 times there's a real possibility that one fighter might win more so than the other just by very little bit very very little here because when I was judging the fight here I thought one person won the other person did so let's go start over in the first round here Andrade is slowly trying to close in the gap between him and Sato Sato is poking Andrade with a series of leg kicks and constantly swinging left and right. Andrade, although losing out in volume and landing the better shots, he um, with him countering a leg kick with a two-punch combination. So Andrade, he's losing out due to the volume that Sato is providing. But S- Sato, though, he is like, yeah, he is landing more strikes, more volume, but Andrade is landing the strikes that you can go look at and are more appealing to the eye test. Because Shoko Sato lands a left to a right leg kick combination, 
while Fabrizio Andrado is going to go land a two-punch combination that obviously is impactful and does a lot more damage than anything Sato is doing. So, from the judge's perspective, it is very difficult to go and see, like, okay, who is actually winning the exchanges here? Do you give the point to Shoko Sato, who's going to land a two-punch combination, ending off with a leg kick, technically three, then a, technically it's a three-strike combination, or Fabrizio Andrade, who although is doing a lot less, is landing the better strikes? And it's not like a case of like Dominic Cruz versus Cody Garban where it was obvious that there was little to no damage being given from Dominic Cruz to Cody, Gar- to Cody Garbrandt. In this case scenario here, it's actually very even and back and forth. So the two begin clinching onto the cage, both of them constantly switching positions here. The narrative of this fight was that Sato really wanted to go to the ground and tap out Fabrizio Andrade, while Andrade wanted to go stand up. So Sato drops himself down onto the ground while Andrade is clinching with him. So Sato drops himself back to the ground in order to go and work on the leg of Andrade. So Sato propels Andrade up in the air with his legs. Then, while Andrade is coming down... Sato then transitions to an arm bar, but Andrade is able to get out and stands up as Sato tries to follow suit. That to me was insane. I've never seen that, where you lift a person up in the air while you're in the bottom position, and then you're catching them that you're catching them in midair into an arm bar or to a triangle position. That to me was absolute insanity. And Fabrizio Andrade here, he was able to get out of it. He was able to stand up. He tells Sato to go stand up, and they both start, you know, going at it, going through these 50 feet exchanges, landing some bombs one right after the other for the second half of the bout here. So uh, Sato does attempt another double leg takedown, but Andrade stops him. One thing Shoko Sato did really well in this fight was the fact that, yes, although the guy was going in for a takedown, trying to win the fight via submission, he was perfectly fine, you know, going in there and striking the guy because Shoko Sato prior to this fight here, does have a history of knocking people out in under like two minutes and having good striking striking changes. So, Shoko Sato, he, even like in the matchup screen, it says here, what type of style is Shoko Sato? He is a striker, while Fabrizio Andrade is a Muay Thai specialist, but it looked like Shoko Sato was trying to be the wrestler of this bout here, and he tried to implement some Jiu-Jitsu game into this bout. And then, so while Shoko Sato, he is letting the more volume strikes, Andrade is landing the clear looking strikes. Shoko Sato, he is constantly um, picking back and forth between shooting in for a takedown or striking with the guy. He is able to strike Fabrizio Andrade enough, and he's able to be that much of a threat in the body kicks and the leg kicks and these like leaning right jabs to the point that Andrade had to respect the guy's punching power, which led to him being open for a couple takedowns down the line in this fight. So Shoko, Saka, Shoko Sato, he is able to win. The majority of the exchanges in the second half of the fight, especially in the last 30 seconds. So for me, I say that in the first round, the first round goes towards the direction of Shoko Sato winning. But as we get to the second round, Rich Franklin, he ends up talking and he rewards the first round to Fabrizio Andrade because he was the one who won in the striking exchanges. And I'm looking at this right now and I'm like, no, he didn't. Fabrizio Andrade was not winning in the exchanges. And then we go over to the third round. I'm kind of skipping the second round here, but as we get to the third round, we hear Rich Franklin again, and Miss Chilson, they're saying, yeah, man, Andrade, he's winning in striking. Well, is he really, though? Is he really? Because in the second round, Andrade, in the first minute and a half, is sort of winning because he's utilizing a lot more jabs in order to prevent Sato from shooting for a takedown. Now, there is an accidental groin strike as Sato leans in for a right hand and Fabrizio Andrade knees him in the groin. That didn't look all that bueno, but... As the two get back on it in the middle of the cage, Sato clinches with him and hits a spinning back elbow twice on Fabrizio Andrade. Second round, I pick Shoko Sato here because the way how I see it, the way how I'm perceiving it, is the fact that, yes, Fabrizio Andrade is a lot more comfortable and he prefers standing up and striking with Shoko Sato. And Shoko Sato obviously is trying to avoid these insane exchanges. But ironically enough, though, even though Fabrizio Andrade is welcoming Shoko Sato to go strike with him. Shoko Sato, how I see it, is actually winning. Yes, there are instances where Fabrizio Andrade, within the span of a minute, is going to land two three-punch combinations that look really good, but those are just like small instances or small like moments in time in the second round. In the second round, I think Shoko Sato was a lot more active. And for me, I choose a fighter who's dictating the pace of a fight and is being very active 
more so than the fighter who is fighting defensively, which is ironic, considering that Fabrizio Andrade is the one chasing after Sato. But Fabrizio Andrade, at times in the second round, was incredibly passive. He was simultaneously moving forward while also fighting defensively. It was kind of strange. And then we could go to the third round, and Shoko Sato just picked up the pace a lot more in his grappling, was able to get to the back mount of Fabrizio Andrade twice in the spout here. Although Shoko Sato, he isn't landing any ground and pound action. Like, he did, like, very little to none, like, action from top position, ground and pounding him. That didn't really happen that much. It was mostly Shoko Sato. The second he got a takedown in was attempting a submission. He would attempt an arm bar, a single leg key lock. There was an instance where Shoko Sato does get a takedown on Fabricio Andrade. Andrade does go for a single leg key lock, but Shoko Sato is able to go reverse out of it. And then the two, like, end up, like, exchanging positions over and over again from guard. It was really cool looking. And so for the third round, it was more of a case of, yet again, like, who do you reward, you know, the strike for? Rich Franklin says, Fabrizio Andrade won first, second, and third round through striking. And I really question that. I really do. All because one fighter prefers striking. And yes, Choke us out. Even though his strategy was not to strike, he still ended up winning the striking changes. And I just don't understand why Fabrizio Andrade would be winning that. Because Andrade, he didn't land that much more strikes than Shoko Sato. Actually, Shoko Sato, he landed more strikes than Andrade. But Andrade hit just hit harder. But did he really hit hard? <laughs> it's like, Fabrizio Andrade, he hit the harder looking combinations. But Shoko Sato still himself landed a lot more strikes. And hit some hard combinations. And hit more leg kicks. And worked the body a lot more. And had multiple takedowns. And Rich Franklin, he was talking about this. Where he was saying that... You know what? Since Fabrizio Andrade was able to defend himself, he shouldn't be docked down in points. And I'm thinking about it. And I'm like, okay, what you're saying is correct. If a fighter is able to avoid the takedowns and is able to avoid being damaged from ground position against a wrestler, they should be rewarded. All right, then. But then we get to the striking, and it's not even that much of a disparity. It really isn't. Because the winner of this bout via unanimous decision goes to Fabrizio Andrade. And then we get to the post-fight press, the post-fight interview here, which Ms. Chilson talked about. It. Wow, Andrade, that's a great performance. What's going to happen next? And Fabrizio Andrade, he's saying that he wants to challenge John Lineker or he wants to be uh, competing for a title soon. And though how I see Fabrizio Andrade, I honestly just don't see it. I don't. I think Shoko Sato should have won the bout. I think he should have won the bout. He was able to get a couple takedowns in. Yes, they were defending off properly, but he still got takedowns. And also, he was able to land a couple of good strikes. He landed more strikes in terms of totality over the course of three rounds of action. Even Mitch Chilson and Rich Funk were talking about it. They were saying, Shoko Sato here, he was the one dictating the pace of the fight. He was the one who was being aggressive. He was the one who was trying to engage with his opponent. So, I just think Shoko Sato should have won based off the fact that he was a lot more active in his opponent. He was a lot more active in his opponent. He landed more strikes. He landed just as many hard-hitting strikes as Andrade. I think Shoko Sato should have won, but in the end, Fabrizio Andrade ended up winning the bout via UNAS decision. So congratulations for both fighters going out there and competing. You're listening to the GSMC MMA Podcast. Come back after a short breaker as I discuss the main events of Pro 1 Championships Unbreakable 3. See you soon. Want to know the latest in soccer? Then listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. From MLS, the World Cup, and the Premier League, we've got you covered. The latest updates, the hottest matches, and news on the league's top players. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. David Beckham scores the goal. Listen now. And we're back. So let's discuss the main events of one championship's Unbreakable 3, which is about between Stan Fredrix versus Alunia Rosahinia. It is about in the Adamant Division. And give you some context of the bout here. So Stan Fredrix, she is, once again, kickboxing and Muay Thai champion, trying to be a three-sport athlete, trying to be a triple belt winner in one championships, which would be insane Muay Thai champion, kickboxing champion, and MMA champion, Stan Fairtex. This girl here, only 23 years old, potentially holding three belts simultaneously on one of the biggest mixed martial arts organizations in the world. That is amazing, but Stan Fairtex, sadly, before this bout here, she ended up losing both her belts. She lost the Muay Thai belt, and she lost the kickboxing belt. 
And we're unsure what Stamp Vertex is in her position in terms of the Adamant Grand Prix that's coming up soon. And then she'll be facing here Alonia Rosahinia, who is a veteran of the sport here, a lot more experienced, a lot more older than her, who is a grappler. So we got this prodigy here, early 20s, kickboxing Muay Thai champion here, expected to be a champion in MMA, versus an experienced wrestler, a well-traveled, you know, all-around-the-world grappler in Rosahinia. So, what's ha going to happen here? Like, is the Prodigy going to come in and destroy her competition and pursue her, like, her destiny as, like, this woman here is going to be, like, the most dominant women's champion out there? Because when you think about, like, dominant women's champions in one championships, there's only two that come to mind. You have Jean Hunan and Angel Lee. And when you look at Stan Fairtex in this bout here, Stan Fairtex, this girl is not just all hype. She has all the tools. All of it. Her striking is elite level. She doesn't need to work more on her striking. Stan Fairtex in this bout here pretty much is what many people believe Clarissa Shields, who is Olympic level, you know, gold medalist boxer, trying to be an MMA fighter in the West. Clarissa Shields, Stan Fairtex, very similar backgrounds. You know, coming in from one sport, wants to dominate the other sports. You know, has a high ceiling, great learner. But the issue though, the barrier, the wall... As to what's going to stop Stan Fairtex and Cruiser Shields from becoming great fighters, even though they have the potential to be amazing fighters, is the fact that they lack the wrestling. They lack the wrestling. And even though they... Okay, now said, not only do they lack wrestling, they lack the experience of wrestling. Because I firmly believe that Cruiser Shields and Stan Fairtex, they know how to wrestle. They know how to grapple, they know how to wrestle. In this bout between Fairtex and Rosahinia, Fairtex was winning in the grappling. She was. And I was so impressed with how this bout went off, where Sam Fairtex was stuffing all the takedowns and she was out grappling, uh, out grappling, out muscling Rosahinia here. So, first round, wash, Fairtex wins. Second round, wash, Fairtex wins. Third round, Sam Fairtex is beating her opponent. But there's only 15 seconds left. 15 seconds left in the third round. If Fairtex wins this. Because you're saying, Fairtex, she's already a top-ranked fighter. If she wins this bout here, there's a real possibility she'd be next in line to fight against Angela Lee. She'd be right there at the doorstep. But in the final 15 seconds, Rosa Hinia gets a takedown. She gets a takedown on Stamp Fairtex. Fairtex, what she should have been doing, that she should have grappled and held onto the arms of Rosahinia and forced her to be inactive. What actually happened, though, was that Sam Fairtex, the second she got taken down, she's like throwing like four arm smashes from the bottom position and she's trying to punch her opponents. And I'm looking at this and I'm like, Stamp, you're like 15 seconds away from winning this bout here. What are you doing? Like, she's not only is she trying to strike from bottom position, she is trying to out-muscle herself out and trying to, like, switch positions on Rosahinia. And this ended up going really bad. I don't get what she was going for here. So, they ended up, they do end up switching positions, sort of, because Rosahinia grabs onto the head of Fairtex. They turn over. Rosahinia has a guillotine choke on Fairtex in the final 10 seconds. And with only 8 seconds left in the bout, you hear the <laughs> sound coming in. So both fighters know. Everyone knows that the fight is about to end. Rosinia sinks in the guillotine choke. In the final 10 seconds, Fairtex taps out. Now only does Fairtex ta uh, taps out, she immediately stands up and she flips out on the referee. Saying like, I did not tap. I did not tap. I did not tap. But then you see the replay. The guillotine was synced in tight. Synced in. Fairtex, it wasn't like, oh man, she's moving her hands. Like, no, no, no. Fairtex, she tapped out with 8 seconds left on the clock. Fairtex looks devastated. Rizal Hinyu pulling off one of the biggest upsets in one championship history. And when I look at this bout here, I feel kind of bad for Fairtex. I really do. I feel great for Rizal Pulling out this like huge upset victory in the main event 
for one championship at Singapore. Great moment for her. Awesome. Utilizing her experience, utilizing, you know, making, you know, taking advantage of Stan Fairtex's lack of experience in grappling with fighters. She was able to take advantage of that. I feel great for her. I feel bad for, I feel bad for Stan Fairtex. And this always happens in many MMA fights. It doesn't matter if it's male or female, where we have a lot of fighters who are like needlessly taking risks when they're winning. This always happens. I always point at Carlos Sparza's wrestling with Brandon Rodriguez because Carlos Sparza, throughout the entire fight, even though she was doing really well for herself in the grappling, would put herself in a bad would be, would put herself in a bad situation because she's being kind of reckless in her fighting. And that's what happened here with Stan Fairtex. All she had to do was play keep away, and if she isn't being able to play keep away in the final fifteen seconds, just hold on, just hold on her, tuck your chin in, and prevent your opponent from making any way in the final couple seconds of the bout here because Fairtex winning like in the 15 minute bout this was she won about 14 minutes and 40 seconds of it she's winning 14 minutes 40 seconds of it Fairtex in like in the when the referee is holding up both fighters arms Fairtex looks upset she's visibly angry Shilson and Michael Chavello, they're talking about it like, oh, wow, this is a huge upset. This is a huge, you know, like, barrier coming away in the future of Stan Fairtex. And here's the thing. Fairtex, she's only 22 years old. She's still, she's still technically a baby in mixed martial arts. Still a baby. Very inexperienced. Hopefully, this is a great experience for her. But it's very upsetting to know that Stan Fairtex here was winning, the, like, 95% of this bout here. It is in the final 5%, things didn't turn out well for her, and that cost her in the bout. So note though, if you are losing, you know, if you if you know you're winning, if you know you're winning the bouts, and your opponent is gonna try to be desperate, just be safe. Just be safe. Nothing wrong being safe. I understand Fairtex's like motive though. She's like, okay, I'm the young gun here. I'm the prodigy. I'm the future world champion. And. Fairtex, if if her brain just didn't turn off in that final couple seconds, she could have won the bouts. And seeing that what we see here, how good of a defensive grappler Fairtex is, how amazing of a striker she is, there's a real possibility out there that Stan Fairtex, if she matched up against Angel Lee, could win. It's true. It's true. Fairtex has showed all the skills. She has all the tools. She is capable of of defeating anybody, whether it be striking, whether it be the ground, she's capable of doing so. It is her brain is turned off in the moment that really mattered the most. And the same thing also applied when she was in kickboxing and in Muay Thai. And Sam Fairtex just has to be able to mature, be able to adapt, and learn from issues like this though. Yes, was it is it really unfair that a fighter ended up losing the bout even though they were winning ninety five percent of the time? Kind of yeah. But that's, that's MMA. You always have to be on your toes. You never know. You close your eyes. You blink for just a couple seconds. Or you look away from your TV screen. Or you look away from your opponent. Something bad can happen. And it costs her the fight. And that is my review of one championship's Unbreakable 3 from beginning to end. It was definitely an emotional show here with Fairtex, you know... Losing her grip in the final couple of seconds of a bout. We got close bout between uh, Shoko Sato and Fabrizio Andrade. Ryota Sawada and Robin Catalan showing a real, like, crap. No. So, Ryota Sawada and Kang Jiwan, two fighters that were really able to showcase their grappling abilities coming back from behind. Really, like, a night full of upsets if you really think about it in terms of, like, fighters who are winning initially end up losing in the tail end of the bouts. We got the one-punch knockout from Amen Buchaba. Helping us open the night, along with uh, Tiao Tang and Paul Lumi. Pick him the pace here, being a fast-paced action fight that was very exciting to watch. From beginning to end here, one championship's Unbreakable 3 was a night full of a whole lot of action. Uh, really fun and enjoyable to watch. And once again, I recommend everybody to go watch one championships when you get the opportunity to do so. Once again, available at Bleach Report Live on YouTube the day right after. So the next major event for One Championships is One Championships Fists of Fury. Yes, that is indeed the title coming up February 26th. You can watch it on Beach Report Live via YouTube. 
and going to the bad here when the fight's setting up is Sanisa Sarisan, hopes to spoil Victoria Lee's MMA debut. This is being written in by Bear Fraser. So Sanisa Thunderstorm Sarisa wants to become the one championship Adamant World Champion one day, and she'll have the opportunity to grab the um grab the rain as she goes and competes on February 26th on a Friday. That evening, the Thai Rising Star is scheduled to welcome Singaporean American teenage sensation Victoria the Prodigy Lee. Yet again, another prodigy making their way to the cage ring with the hopes of winning a title. So, although Lee is just, get this, 16 years old. Yeah. One Championship's Fist of Fury, February 26, has a 16-year-old prodigy making their way. The One Championship debutant is a two-time world champion, a 2020 Hawaii State Wrestling Champion, and a 15-time Naga Expert Champion. What's more, she has trained in various martial arts since she was very young. She still is very young. Facing a true prodigy would intimidate most athletes, but Sarisa is not shaken. Thunderstorm has been polishing her own skills at Mr. Cook Gym and feels that she is fully prepared. She goes on to say, I've been training since the new year, never taking a break for even one day while people hang out. I'm still on the mats. So, um, note this. Sarisa is 20 years old. Victoria Lee is only 16. And one of them is called a prodigy, the other one isn't. Can you imagine that in the West? If we have a 16 year old and a 20 year old compete with one another in a professional sports, in one of the biggest organizations in the world out there, broadcasted to thousands upon people, millions watching? It would be insane! Absolute insanity. But as Shreesing goes on to say that in addition to her grappling and submission defense, Shreesing's team at Mr. Cook Gym has provided the fighter with some new training techniques that would pay dividends now and the future. She goes on to say, My coach put me on the mat with some men who are some super wrestlers, and some are heavier than 100 kilograms. Also, I have a new weight training coach. He is from Ireland and he helps me build stronger muscles. So yeah, these women, oh my goodness, are doing things that a lot of male fighters would not be open to doing at their weights. Once again, this is in the atom weight division. Atom weights. A division that is so small, it's not even in the UFC or at Bellator or at PFL. That's how small they are. Actually, we have a plethora of atom weight champions coming from Victa to the UFC who then compete at strawweights. But we got woman here, 16 years old. World champion. Another woman, 20 years old, wrestles with sumo wrestlers. That right there is absolute insanity. And oh my goodness, how are you not hyped up for anything to happen one championships? Well, you, also, you better be. You better be hyped up for one championships because you are seeing top of the line great athletes who, for all we know, one day will be competing in the largest Western MMA organization out there in the world in the UFC. It could happen. Well, Dana White, although he, his plans to go have a UFC event happen in East Asia, that plan did not fall through. It actually, actually, it ended up failing just two days prior to this recording. Now, I do know that the UFC they want to go and expand their businesses over to East Asia. They want to go get, they want to go and bring in more East Asian talent. They're already doing it right now with the performance center being built. In East Asia, they're trying to bring in fighters from China specifically to go and compete over here. They want to have a UFC event to happen at China at some point in the near future. They want they're like they're full on all aboard the Zhang Weili train of hyping her up, and she really does have the potential to be a great international star, more bigger than any other international fighter that they currently have right now in the UFC. That's how much potential she has, and that just speaks in volumes of how much potential of great athletes there are in East Asia, who could compete in the West one day. And so with that being said, you have been an awesome audience. That is my review of One Championship's Unbreakable 3. You should be a lot more informed of mixed martial arts organizations that go beyond the West. Go pay attention to a lot more fighters in East Asia. Trust me, you are going to love it. With that being said, all I gotta say is thank you. Thank you for tuning into the GSMC MMA Podcast. Brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I like to ask you, please remember to subscribe to the show and write a nice review. That really helps us. Also, if you can please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you, and have a good night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts MMA Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.com. 
gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program. We'll be right back.